Welcome to episode 77 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the work of writer director J.J. Abrams, as well as his creator, Bad Robot Universe. I'm your host, my name is Marcelo Inestroza, joined as always by my fellow co host, Matt Crandall. And on today's edition of the show, we'll be taking a look at J.J.'s directorial debut, the 2006 film Mission Impossible 3. So with that out of the way and done with, Matt, what did you think of Mission 3? So back in the day, my first impression of Mission 3 was that I was absolutely blown away. I was counting down to it because I do love the Mission Impossible franchise. Tom Cruise has always been one of my favorite movie stars. And I was a diehard Alias fan. So when it was announced that J.J. was doing Mission Impossible, it seemed like a natural progression. And, you know, here was going to be a first time feature film director given a budget of one hundred and fifty million dollars to revitalize this franchise, because at that point, Mission one was huge. De Palma killed it. Mission two was so polarizing that a lot of people were done with Mission Impossible. So you needed a guy like JJ to step in and revitalize it and update it in a way that felt fresh and appealed to modern audiences. And the way he did it is by making this Mission Impossible movie as close to an episode of Alias as he possibly could. Because if you watch Alias and then this movie, the structure is almost the same. Alias often would start with in medias res, which means you start with a scene that comes much later out of context to grab us. And then we go back and figure out how we got there. Like a famous alias where in the opening, it seems like Dixon has gone rogue and murdered someone on our team. And then we have to figure out how that happened by going 48 hours earlier. JJ, when he got this gig after a long gestating development, brought in his buddies, Kurtzman and Orsi, to help get this script. Both guys who had worked on Alias and they got Team Alias together and said, Let's do what we did for spies on TV for the big screen. And I friggin' lost my mind because this movie had incredible action, that great JJ dialogue, visual flair, and just felt like the most fresh updating of Mission after Mission 2 was so stylized that it pushed a lot of people out. This one brought people back in, and I was running around that whole summer telling people like you're sleeping on the best movie of the summer by not going to see mission impossible three. And they're like, oh, but Tom Cruise is crazy. I'm like, I don't give a shit if Tom Cruise is crazy. This movie's amazing. Um, so that, that was it. Now watching it now, I still love it. But now that mission has gone like to sky high heights, it doesn't stand as my favorite mission movie but it's still a great movie. Marcel, what did you think when this thing came out? I can distinctly remember being at home watching some sporting event and then seeing the first teaser for this trip, for this film. And I was like, holy shit, because I had, you know, I had seen mission one and mission two, you know, years earlier when I was at home watching, you know, watching some sorting of it and the, and the teaser came on, I was shocked because it had, it had been such a long gestating period between mission two and mission three that I really didn't think they were going to do another one. So this film really came out of nowhere for me and where it really started to gain more importance for me is when I started to fall in love with JJ as a director and Alex and Bob as writers, because you did mention that this step, that this movie is basically a giant episode of Alias. I mean, for God's sakes, it is. It even has Tom Cruise in a chair, like uh, JJ had Sydney in the in the pilot of Alias. For God's sakes. Yeah, there are a lot of callbacks that if you have watched Alias, you can see the parallels to this, and even so so far as the big opening action sequence that brings back Ethan into the fold is JJ saying, what if we cast Felicity as Sydney Bristow and she got up to her neck and shit and had to be bailed out by Ethan Hunt? 
There's only one thing that I don't like about this movie. There's only one solitary thing. And that thing is JJ's, deci- JJ's decision to kill Felicity Porter. For those of you who have listened to the show before, you know that, it, you know that uh, Felicity is my second favorite TV show of all time. So when he killed Felicity Porter, I, w- I wanted to... I wanted to I wanted to strangle the guy. It's the killing of Felicity Porter that really sets Ethan on his emotional journey for the rest of the movie. Is that the first two main villains of the Mission franchise? The first film it was Ethan against the government. The second film it was Ethan against a rogue agent. And in this film it's it's against somebody who outwits Ethan and who outthinks him. And a lot of uh, a lot of people who are mission heads in the community, they think that mission doesn't have any good strong villains. But I beg to differ. I think with the with the amount of screen time that Philip Seymour Hoffman has in this film, and granted it's not much, but with the amount of screen time that he has, he poses such a giant threat to Ethan throughout the course of this movie. Because from the beginning of the film, Ethan is tied to a chair, and this guy is screaming at the top of his lungs. Where's the rabbit foot? Where, you know, where is the rabbit's foot? You know, and then Ethan just has a, has a look of pure panic and out of control on his face. And for most of this movie, Ethan is behind the eight ball, in my estimation. And seeing that as a mission fan is fantastic. Also, this is the first time in the series that we get to see uh, uh, the the home life of Ethan Hunt, and we get to see sort of sort of a more uh, emotional side to him. So I really really appreciated that JJ, Bob, and Alex did that. Yeah, I love that, and I do think Philip Seymour Hoffman's Owen Davian is one of the best villains, definitely of the Mission franchise. He is the best villain, um, but one of the most intense on screen villains that we get, and the reason. It sets that up right away because Davian does not come into the movie until like an hour and 10 into a 210 movie. But because we get that opening scene, which again, that's a a screenwriting tool that JJ has used before on TV, has a literal ticking clock within it as Davian is counting to 10. Hoffman is so intense in those moments that we immediately know he is not fucking around. And the way that they sell it is that he is just cold, calculated, but also he starts to really lose his cool. And he's losing it, and we still don't know who this woman in the chair really is. And I love that they sprinkle in references to events that have happened in the timeline, but that we haven't seen yet. So we have Philip Seymour Hoffman saying, like, you know, that thing that happened, this is payback for the plane. I told you this was going to happen. I said this and we're like, when did he say that? What, what is he talking about? But they leave those breadcrumbs so that later when we start connecting those dots, we're more invested in the events as they take place after anybody who thought that Tom Cruise was just a pretty face or wasn't willing to put in the work. I defy you to watch that opening scene and not tell me that that's some of the most intense and emotional acting that he has done in the entire mission series. It is so fucking good that no wonder they opened the movie with that scene, the emotion and just the intensity in Tom Cruise's face and eyes in that five minute sequence is the reason this guy is one of the biggest movie stars in the world. You can't deny it. And so to start your movie with a full frame of our hero, almost weeping, just so intense that he is rattled. He is shaking. The water is welling in his eyes. It's, it's not the way you start a typical action movie. We don't see Arnold Schwarzenegger or Keanu on the verge of tears in the opening frames, but that humanizes Ethan Hunt makes Owen Davian a bigger threat. And then as you say, when we go to the party after when we're actually in the the linear timeline of the movie, we then start to connect dots and realize that Ethan Hunt is not who we last saw him as. He is a guy who has decided to settle down. And through the first 15 minutes, we find out he is in love with one of my loves, Michelle Monaghan as Julia, as a big kiss, kiss, bang, bang fan. I just, ever since that movie, anything she's in, I will watch. And, uh, 
seeing him and her have this fun, playful relationship and us finding out that he is now a teacher rather than somebody who is putting his life on the line is a nice way to get us invested. And of course, that opening party features a a checklist of bad robot shit where Grunberg is at the party. Kurtzman and Orsi are at the party. You can see them in the movie. And Aaron Paul, who is not Jesse Pinkman yet, is in a blink and you miss it. He's got two lines in the entire movie as Julia's brother. They give her sisters more screen time. And I'm like, I don't know. Is there some way we can swing back around in mission seven and eight and have Aaron Paul show up as some sort of important character? Because when he's just in that blink and you miss it moment twice in the movie, I'm like, they do realize who they had on set here, right? Like, come on. But I'm sure that you love, you know, when we, when we see Grunberg and when we see, Kurtzman and Orsi is definitely a blink and you miss it, but they're sitting on that couch at the party having a good time. When I was watching this movie last night and it goes to that scene with Julia and her girlfriends around the kitchen table and they're they're discussing Julia's previous boyfriends and she's trying to remember the name of the lake and Ethan is just a little bit off screen and he can actually, he's making drinks and he can see, he, you know, you know, he can see them talking, but also JJ does something very unique in the scene when he shows Ethan making drinks, he does a small push in to Julia's mouth. So that indicates to us that Ethan can read lips. So when he finally dis- you know, figures out what they're talking about, he goes, so yeah, Julia's like, I can't remember the name of the lake. What was the name of that lake? And Ethan just pops out and he goes, Lake Wanaka, Lake Wanaka. And right after that scene, it goes to a scene of a bunch of people dancing and two people are there in specific. You just said it. Bob and Alex are there. I'd never caught that before, but something something compelled me to look at that specific scene a little bit closer last night. And I'm like, holy shit, that's Bob and Alex. The other great thing about that scene is when Ethan is talking to a bunch of people about his job. He studies traffic patterns. And the way that he's talking about it, it sounds like the most interesting thing in the world. But the kicker is the person who he's talking to it about. He's he's talking to Sean about traffic patterns. And I was like, this is awesome. I just love when Grumberg's like pretending like it's it's a conversation that puts him to sleep and all the women are enamored with Tom Cruise and there's Grunberg just looking like a chump. The great thing that the party does is it really establishes the place that Ethan is in his life and it really does a good job of establishing the loving relationship that he has with Julia throughout the course of the film. If their relationship doesn't work, the movie, I, I believe, begins to fall flat in his face. Do you think that's uh, true? Yeah, that is a big linchpin of if this movie works. And I think the other thing that is vitally important is that they surround Tom Cruise in this movie, alias style, with a team. We bring back Ving Rhames as Luther, which you love to see it. We add Simon Pegg as Benji, who is basically Marshall from Alias, 100%. Uh, and then we've got Jonathan Rhys Myers and Maggie Q. I absolutely fucking love Maggie Q. And I wish that she would somehow, you know, get more work in this fray because she's so good. Uh, but not only that, we also build up the IMF like bureaucrats by introducing fucking Morpheus, <laughs> Lawrence Fishburne, as the guy who's busting balls and Billy Crudup as Musgrave who one of my favorite movies of all time is almost famous. So anytime Billy Crudup is in anything, you have got my attention because this guy is just phenomenal. Even on a piece of shit TV show, like the morning show, Billy Crudup. Perfect. Uh, So I love that at the party, Cruz gets a phone call from JJ Abrams telling him that he's won a trip. And that gives him the, the signal that he goes. And that first meeting when it's an exposition dump, but we find out, that Crudup works at IMF and they need Hunt to come back because his trainee is caught. And anybody following this podcast might catch a blatant, I have to think it was intentional, the first shot of Cruz and Crudup in the convenience store, slightly blurred in the foreground on a display of chips are a bunch of bags of Ritz crackers. The guy who wrote regarding Henry, where Ritz crackers played a 
key part of the story that cannot be a coincidence. So I was like, okay, JJ, I see you. I see what you're doing here, buddy. Cause we're getting this intense scene and all I can see is these bag of writs. I was like, holy shit. He, he did it. This guy loves, he must love them. Tom Cruise wasn't painting them, but we framed them in the foreground of that meeting. And so I love that. Then we find out, you know, as the movie unfolds, because it seems like this moment where Carrie Russell is this damsel in distress and everybody says to Cruz, you didn't train her good enough because she wasn't ready. And that sits really wrong with me as the movie's going, because one, I love Carrie Russell. So the fact that we would think that she was underprepared makes me furious. And the fact that they kill her off, obviously the IMF didn't do good enough training. The Russians would step in later and give her perfect spy training as the twists and turns unfold, we find out that is not the case and that there is a mole within the IMF and Carrie Russell sends Cruz a postcard with a micro dot addressed to Mr. Kelvin. Again, I think your bad robot alarms must be going off because this shit works its way into everything. And she says, I think it's Fishburne, Brassel, something is up. People are leaking information. And so at least then it sets these events into motion where Cruz has to stop Philip Seymour Hoffman, but also he doesn't know who he can trust at the IMF, which of course in any spy, anything, there has to be a moment where an agent either goes rogue or there's a mole leaking information, but they do it in a nice way that it doesn't feel ham fisted and it doesn't feel like we're just checking boxes of spy genre stuff. They work it in and it makes that opening scene seem less damsel in distress because she was on a suicide mission that she didn't realize from the get go because she was ratted out by this mole. What are you thinking as we're, we're checking off some of those spy boxes, but the way that they work in with such great character actors delivering this information are you ever ahead of the movie or are the reveals surprising as we're hitting them? The first time I saw this movie, I won't lie, when Felicity, you know, spoke to Ethan and said, I think I'm being set up. I think it's Brassel. I really, really, for a good portion of the film, the first time I saw it, I bought that. But I was I was really, really taken aback when the giant mole within the IMF was re was revealed to be Billy Crudup. Because I was like, okay, throughout, throughout the course of the movie, Billy Crudup has a very um, has a very strange relationship with his superior, Brassel. And I was like, is this justified? This, did, did the movie do enough to justify what this guy is going to say right now? And his explanation as to, as to why he did it, it works to a certain extent, but it doesn't really work. If that point in the movie really breaks your back and really pushes you to not liking the film, then you're not paying attention. Because as you said, this film is done with such care, such preciseness. For JJ's first time out on the big stream, I think that he did a really, really particularly good job with framing. And what I mean by framing is that in, you know, uh, when, when JJ would have, you know, Ethan and um, uh, Julia on a roof talking about something, the, the thing that JJ does often is that he pushes in real close to the people's faces. So you see their emotion display on, display on their face as they're talking. And for some people, some people be like, dude, back up the fucking camera. Why are you so close in their face? But for somebody who loves TV like I do and who loves that style of directing, I really, really enjoy J.J.'s directorial choice to be right in the actor's faces throughout the course of this movie. So I really love it. Also, there is a, <laughs> there's, a, which, uh, there's a particular scene on a bridge, which I'm sure that we're going to get to at some point. But that scene on that bridge is just fantastic. The pace, the, 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 the action beats, everything about that particular scene is fantastic. So I thought for a first time director, I thought that JJ knocked out of the park in this film. Now, granted we are biased, but if you're asking me for my honest opinion, I thought that he did a fantastic job uh, with his first time out uh, directing, uh, you know, a main feature film. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the bias comes because of movies like this, where you just see how confident he is with where he places the camera 
and filming these larger than life action scenes and making them intense. And there are moments that feel Michael Bay esque where Tom Cruise throws Lindsay a gun in slow motion. And then they almost do the Michael Bay 360 shot as they're trying to shoot their way out of this German warehouse. But the framing in the, the emotional moments where we get those TV like tight close-ups make it so intense and intimate, but then the action, every time there's a major action sequence, it's not insane, quick MTV cutting. It's more measured and we can see the geography of where everyone is, but it's never not intense. So that bridge scene when they're trying to extract Davian and Tom Cruise gets blindsided by, you know, this huge missile that comes out and like oh, this whole thing starts off and he's got to jump this gap is intense as hell. And when he gets thrown into a car and the glass is shattering, you can feel the intensity and the, of the impact and a lot of it is just the way that it's filmed and the way that they let it play out. And credit goes to JJ and Dan Mindel, who did the cinematography. And yes, in that opening action sequence, we do have a shit ton of lens flares that kick off where they're rescuing Carrie Russell. And there's a lot of blue lens flares that come into the frame because that is a stylistic choice. And obviously, when you're working with a certain cinematographer who might lean into that, but it's not they haven't gone to 11 yet. We're going to save that for a few movies from now where we just let it rip. But those signature visual things are here. And as we are weaving in great action with great character, we do have a mystery box that the main MacGuffin of the movie being the rabbit's foot. And we are never told what this rabbit's foot is actually is and it's teased throughout the movie what's the rabbit's foot why it's so important and we never find out so that is another jj abrams kind of hallmark that i'm sure as he's sitting down with bob and alex to write the script he's like we need a MacGuffin." they come up with this thing and somebody probably says what is it he goes doesn't fucking matter <laughs> we don't have to say what it is you know even if you'd have a, a nagging need to know what it is. It doesn't matter to the story. It's just something that if the bad guys got, it would be bad. And that's all we need to know. And I love the simplicity of that. But like you said, the action is sort of where mission impossible lives and dies. And there's multiple awesome action sequences in this, that opening the bridge, the, the big jump to get the rabbit's foot. And when Cruz, this is the only Ethan hunt moment that's played for comedy, but feels false when he's got the rabbit's foot and he crashes into the window and he's still got his parachute attached and he's looking. And then the wind comes and takes him back out the window. It's hilarious, but everything we know about Ethan Hunt, he would have detached that parachute. The second he landed on that table, <laughs> that wouldn't have happened, but it's a nice joke. And with the, the big sequence where the rabbit's foot is rolling on the ground is so fun and playful and intense that I don't mind, but if we had if we had multiple moments like that, it would have rang false like you were just trying to jam in some levity, but they only hit that occasionally, so it really works. And I do like these moments where Ethan gets captured by the IMF because they think that he has gone rogue and he doesn't know who to trust, and those just make the, the mystery of the whole spy genre a lot of fun, and we get those callbacks where Ethan can read lips so he can get a coded message that nobody knows about. He can escape. So I love that, and I just love seeing Ethan wrapped up in a spy story that all goes back to his love for this woman. That's the heart of the story, and if they don't have good chemistry, it doesn't work, and it plays well, regardless of where that would go in the future. In this movie, it works 100%. And I say that, but I also did love how they weaved it back in and fall out. So I, I'm not criticizing it, but I did think that that was the most interesting thing somebody else wouldn't have brought to it. That was a thing that JJ, it, it feels like something he would have insisted on to really drive the story. You mentioned the chemistry between Ethan and Julia. I really like, like my favorite, I have two standout Ethan and Julia moments in this movie. The first one is when Ethan comes back from 
Berlin after losing Lindsay and he walks into his house and Julia welcomes him at the door and he says nothing. But you could obviously tell that Ethan was destroyed because he had just lost he just lost Asian Ferris. And the way that um the way that Monaghan sort of just he understands that there's something wrong with Ethan, but she can't put her finger on it. The way that JJ directs that over the shoulder shot of showing uh, uh, Monaghan's reaction while she's in Tom Cruise's arms was just great. And the other, the final scene that I like is when after having the big blow off fight with Davian in the Chinese warehouse, after Davian gets decapitated by the car, which is cool. Uh, it's kind of anticlimactic though, but it's cool. Ethan is rumbling, you know, rushing to the warehouse because uh, Davian activated the electric charge in his head. So he's rushing around the warehouse looking for a defibrillator. And the way that he's talking to Julian, he says, listen, I'm going to look for a defibrillator, but after I do, I have to kill myself and it's your job to bring me back. Right. And, you know, and he says, just in case somebody shows up, he explains to her how to use a gun. Seeing their dynamic and all their all the wonderful quirks that they have, even when Ethan is close to death, and the, and the cool thing about that is, before Ethan kills the power and turns it back on, so he electric he electrocutes himself. He says he puts the he puts the thing in between his mouth and he says, "Wait, wait, wait! I love you." And it's just so great. And then you know, and then when you know when he dies, you you see Julia, you know, frantically you know trying to bring him back to life, and just what she says. The music by Giacchino is so wonderful in this scene. That whole sequence is dynamite. I love it so fucking much. I love it. I'm glad you love it. I do love the ticking clock, and I do love him searching for the defibrillator. I don't love her pounding on his chest trying to bring him back because we know that Tom Cruise is not going to die in Mission Impossible 3. So even even though Giacchino is working his ass off in that moment with the score, I that's my least favorite part on a rewatch where she's, you know, trying to bring him back to life. And then she does. I'm like, just have her know what to do and bring him back right away. Don't make this moment where we think that he's dead because it's a false. Ethan is going to die in mission impossible three. Come on. So that's my only, but the emotion is there, especially in the lead up. And I do love, like you said, him searching for the defibrillator and explaining how to use a gun are great moments where he's just distilling this spy shit to like, it's most easily accessible basic stuff so that because they don't have time, there's, there's that ticking clock. And we know that this charge is not messing around. I do think that for all of his terror and menace, yeah. Having Philip Seymour Hoffman go out cause he gets hit by a car in a fluke accident is one of those like, really? But we're at the two hour mark of a movie that's 206. And so I just want it to be, I want it to wrap up. So I'm fine that we didn't drag it out. If it had gone on, people would have been like return of the King much. And we would have just been annoyed. So I do think that it worked fine. And again, Hoffman throughout, especially that key showcase scene is so great and menacing, but I love that also in the middle of the movie, uh, before he is hung out the plane and we find out what that's all about. And I love when he says, you know, you can find out a lot about a person by how they treat somebody they don't have to be nice to, which is something that anybody who's worked in retail will tell you that <laughs> you could tell a lot about people if, by the way they treat people they don't have to treat nice. As serious as he is, the whole sequence where they are trying to get Davian so that they can replace him is so much fun when we find out that Ethan and Julia secretly got married and we see how they make the masks. And then in one shot, we go from Cruz sitting there and he puts on the mask. And over the course of this shot, it goes from being a loose fitting mask to being Philip Seymour Hoffman with Tom Cruise's voice saying, we got married yesterday. And Luther's like, well, congratulations. He's like, thanks, man. Thanks a lot. And it's just that. And then when Hoffman and Hoffman come face to face in the bathroom is so much fun. This is the, we're doing a serious spy movie, but if we aren't having fun, then what's the fucking point? And I just think that that's the, the moment where you're in the theater chomping on your popcorn going perfect. 
This is, I'm having an absolute blast. And in those moments, Luther gets a big moment. Maggie Q gets a big moment. Everybody in the Vatican sequence is just having so much fucking fun that it's contagious. That then when the movie gets super serious for that last hour, we're with it. Because we had a great time in that middle section. And I think that's part of the genius of the way that the story is structured. That we get the levity before we get super serious. And then we get that emotional send-off. And I just loved all of that. And, of course, that humor that Peg injects in those few scenes near the near the end, especially. Where he's talking on the phone to Ethan and he doesn't want to be. Because he knows that he will be, you know, could be court-martialed if he gets caught. And he's just pretending like he's talking to someone else. Was um, perfect. And I'm glad that this movie introduced characters who would end up becoming part of the core DNA of mission going forward. And as much as I love mission impossible one and think it's an amazing movie, I do think that the thing that took mission to the next level was the involvement of bad robot because mission impossible three amazing movie ghost protocol. Get the fuck out of here. You can't do better than ghost protocol. Rogue Nation, oh my god, are you kidding? And then Fallout, holy shit, this might be the best one. So I think that when you when you watch a series, you don't expect a third movie to, one, not even end the series. It's not a trilogy, it's not a closer. It injects fresh life into this property, but also sets a new template that would continue to work for 15 plus years because this is the template that they use for all of the the next ones where it's got that emotional humor that fun all of that is in the dna as well as still feeling like mission impossible so that fans of the tv show can still see something they recognize but it's updated for a modern audience and i do have to say that you know it's awesome to see Cruz kicking ass and as much as it feels like the guy hasn't aged a day, when I watch this now, I was like, holy shit, is he young compared to what he looks like now? And even crud up, I was like, oh my God, look at these guys. Where did the time go? Because I don't even feel like they're old men now, but compared to this, holy crap. People say that Cruz is drinking from a, a, a vat of baby blood with uh, with Keanu, but I don't, I like, like, I don't know if that baby blood is working anymore because you could see the age from this movie to where the mission franchise is now. I really love that JJ, Bob and Alex decided to bring back the team aspect of mission impossible. Because like I said previously at the start of this podcast, I said mission one was Ethan against the government. Mission two was Ethan against somebody else. And it wasn't until mission three that JJ, Bob and Alex really got the point of mission and that is a team of spies going to do something and look you're you're not gonna you, you're not gonna find another you're not you're probably not gonna find another person on this planet or in this hemisphere that loves brian de palma's original mission film i mean it's that film that inspired me to become a storyteller poor emilio got shish kebab by an elevator i really loved that this film relied on the team aspect and if it wasn't for the team, Tom Cruise would have lost his wife. Scene. I love the scene when uh, Luther and uh, Ethan are in the IMF and they're talking to Benji and Benji just gives this speech about what the rabbit foot can technically be. And I loved his speech that he gave. And Peg, he's he's got this quirky geekiness to him, but also like... Uh, this put upon like, oh shit, why am I the guy who has to deal with this crap? But not in like a heavy way. But I just love that anytime we have any of the team together, the banter and everything going on is just chef's kiss. It's it's some of the most fun chemistry throughout that would carry on throughout all the rest of the movies. So I just love that aspect. I was really surprised that when this movie, you know, came out, the first film with Brian De Palma made a shit ton of money. The second one for a while was the highest rated film in the franchise going, I don't get it. I don't get Because, look, I love that film. I saw that film when I was in junior high. So it had, look, I love Mission 2. It has a special place in my heart. But that film is not Shakespeare. That film is more 
more inf- you know more notorious than than Mission. Again, I just appreciated the fact that JJ, Alex, and Bob, and all the producers of this film decided, okay, if we're gonna do Mission for a third time, we're gonna give the the fans of this franchise and the fans of the TV show a proper Mission story. And I love that. I mean, I mean, don't even get me started out. Don't don't even get me started on Ghost Protocol, which I'm sure that we're going to cover on this podcast at some point. But yeah, I just love this film. Everything that Bad Robot did with the Mission franchise reinvented it in a way that still to this day, it's one of my top three action franchises, if not my number one. You know, when we talk about modern straight ahead like action stuff, it is... Mission Impossible, John Wick, the Fast series. So it's one of those things where it's insane that we are counting down. The The number keeps getting bigger, but like I'm counting down to Mission Impossible 7. And after Mission Impossible 2, I don't know that I would have felt that way. But after 3, I'm like, as long as we keep up this level of quality, give me 15. <laughs> I'll take them all. Uh, so I love that. And of course... J.J. Abrams on the phone, but also in a hospital scene in the background. So Eagle Eye viewers can catch another cameo from the guy as we see his progression from those early cameos where he's looking super young and didn't have the look. But here he's he's looking like modern J.J. with the glasses. So you can pretty much even though he's out of focus, you can get the distinct. Oh, that's that guy. And I just love seeing we talked briefly about Giacchino and Giacchino's work is really good in this movie. A lot of very similar motifs used in the score and sounds that he did use on Alias and Lost, where you can hear certain notes and certain interplay between the the themes that come and go that is very reminiscent of his work on those two shows, not in a bad way at all, because I love the music for Alias and especially, obviously, Lost. But there are a lot of moments even in the quiet stuff or where we hit like a really high pitch, like, boom, boom, boom. and I'm like, this is, this is pure Giacchino lost uh, stuff. So I do think that this movie works really well because of the use of the music. And it is some of his, his most memorable work in the feature film space at this point, because he's a guy who mostly came up in video games. And then obviously lost is going to, be etched on his tombstone because the music for it is so iconic. But this was one of the first feature films because he did the Pixar stuff, but you know, Incredibles or whatever has a few themes here and there, but the mission score is, is amazing. And of course the guy is currently still absolutely killing it. Shout out to the Batman, but that's all I got to say on mission three. JJ's directorial debut blew me away, made me, so happy that he was able to take what he did on TV, translate it to a $150 million large scale film. And he's never looked back. He's, he's continued to, to work in this big, huge space and eight times out of 10, knock it out of the park. And Michael's score for this film that I love the theme that he wrote for Julia and Ethan, but I love the fact that, for 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 people that grew up watching the mission the, the original Mission Impossible series, there's this one track that Lilo, that Lilo Schifrin kept kept using throughout the series, and that track is called the plot. And the fact that Giacchino brought back the plot, but he made it bigger and he made it better and he made it louder, was just great. I loved every I loved the decision to bring back the plot theme. I love it so much. As much as I love. You know, uh, four, five. I do think that it would be cool if, if they do, a, you know, a mission nine, which I don't know because Tom Cruise is getting older. Or older. I do think it'd be cool if they gave Macquarie a rest, and they brought in another guy. Now, here's the point where Matt quits the show. I do love Chris Macquarie and what he has done with Mission, but I, I will wait and see because. I think four four movies in a row is where a director usually voluntarily taps out and says, I need a break. Because even Justin Lin over on the Fast and the Furious movies, he took a break and then he came back. So you never know. We might see. I would love 
obviously I don't think JJ has any interest in directing it. And especially with his track record of Star Trek and Star Wars, when the first time everybody's like, bravo. And the second time everybody's like, fuck you. But we'll see. I think especially we'll have to see how seven and eight, if we're talking just mission purely how those play out, because I know that a lot of people at the end of fallout were thinking like, what more can we do in this Macquarie cruise mode? And they got two movies worth to show us. Hopefully we won't feel fatigued by the end. And that'll do it for this edition of radio 815. Listen, if you guys like anything that we do here at all, and you want to reach out to us for whatever reason, uh, you can reach out to us uh, a couple ways. The first way to do that is just to reach out to us on Twitter by simply using the hashtag uh, Radio815, or you can reach out to us also on Twitter on our personal Twitter page. It's uh, JJUniverse815, or uh, if you want to speak to me personally, I'm also on Twitter. I'm at CreekFanatic88. Matt, if the good folks at home want to reach out to you and talk to you about anything, what would be the best place for them to do that? On Twitter at Matt Crandall. I just want to let you guys know that we recently launched our very own YouTube channel at youtube.com slash radio 815, where every Monday we release old episodes of our show. So that's another place where you can listen to us. If you don't necessarily want to listen to us on whatever podcast feed you have to be, you happen to be listening to us on at this very point in time. Another way that you can listen to us and speak to us, if you would like, for those of you who are still on Facebook, we also have a Facebook page. It's JJ Universe 815. So come over there and chat whatever we get on either of these platforms. We will actually respond to you and give you a shout out on this very show of ours. But here's a little sneak peek as to what's coming next week. Next week, me and Matt are going to spend five years in a little town called Boston, Massachusetts with our very, very close friends, agents Olivia Dunham, Peter Bishop, and Walter Bishop. So on that note, I shall leave you with this simple message. As always, until next time, we'll talk back soon. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.